Happy, happy spring in Vermont for folks who are out of state. Welcome to Norwich University. I am Dr. Roly Brucken, Professor of History at Norwich. My specialty is the history of international human rights law and U.S. foreign policy. I've taught classes relevant to this panel on the Cold War, human rights in Eastern Europe, and genocide. Having served as Amnesty International USA's country specialist on Zimbabwe for 18 years, I'm well acquainted with investigating human rights abuses, including war crimes, crimes against humanity, and genocide. Before I introduce the panel, I humbly ask us to take a moment of silence right now in memory of the victims, each of whom are individuals with parents, partners, children, friends, and who have aspirations, dreams, talents, and a desire to live in peace, as all of us do in this room. Thank you very much. I want to thank the staff of Norwich University's John and Mary Frances Patton's Peace and War Center, including Director Dr. Travis Morris and Associate Director Dr. Yang Mo Ku. I also want to thank today's panelists and you, the audience, for your time and commitment to self-education and public discussion of critical issues of international importance. It's an honor to moderate a distinguished panel. Let me introduce the folks on the panel. Lyle Goldstein is Director of Asia Engagement at Defense Priorities, previously served as a research professor at the US Naval War College for 20 years. His expertise includes maritime security and nuclear security issues. He has published seven books on Chinese strategy. He speaks Chinese and Russian and is currently writing a book on China-Russian relations. He holds a BA from Harvard, an MA from Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies, and a PhD from Princeton. Nicholas Gavostev is Professor of National Security Affairs at the US Naval War College. He currently holds non-residential fellowships with the Foreign Policy Research Institute and the Carnegie Council for Ethics and International Affairs. He has taught at Baylor, Georgetown, George Washington, Harvard Extension, and Brown Universities. From 2016 to 2020, he served as the Captain Jerome E. Levy Chair in Economic Geography and National Security. Mary Manjikian teaches undergraduate and graduate courses in intelligence, disaster assistance management, national security affairs, and terrorism. She is the author of two books on cyber politics and is also a Fulbright scholar. She is a former US Foreign Service officer with service in the Netherlands, Russia, and Bulgaria. Manjikian received her BA in Russian from Wellesley College, a master's in philosophy from Oxford University, and an MA and PhD in political science from the University of Michigan. Lasha Chantaridze is professor and director of the graduate programs in diplomacy and international relations for Norwich University. He is also a Harvard University Davis Center Associate Research Fellow for the Center for Defense and Security Studies at the University of Manitoba, Winnipeg, Canada and an advisory member, member of the Peace and War Center here. He earned his PhD in International Affairs from Queen's University, Kingston, Ontario, Canada. Here's the format for today. I'd like to give each of the panelists two minutes to give an op opening remarks on the topic of US-Russian relations. I've then got three or four questions uh, for the panel that will take maybe 25, 30 minutes, and then for the rest of the time, we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So let me start uh, by asking Dr. Goldstein if he could prevent, uh, and we'll go from then uh, to his left on down the line for two minutes or so of opening remarks. Yes, hi, thank you, and uh, so so honored to be here. Um, and and you know I just would say up front that uh, I'm glad we had a moment of silence there. I, I am appalled by the events of the uh, uh, last four weeks and. Uh, you know, condemn in the strongest terms what, what uh, the Kremlin has done. Um, uh, let me uh, just lay out a, a couple of ideas here because I think uh, let you know kind of where my focus is. Um, uh, I think, you know, uh, taking off of uh, what uh, Thomas Graham said yesterday that um, 
for all the moral outrage, uh, moral outrage probably is not the best way to form up our, our national security policy going forward. Um, let me suggest two respects in which that I think is particularly important. And what, the first is concerning nuclear security. And we heard a, a very uh, important lecture yesterday from the General Deputy uh, Commander of STRATCOM. And I assure you, he chose his words extremely carefully, so you may want to reread your notes there. But the nuclear shadows over this crisis are, are very considerable. Uh, and um, I'll just, uh, I meant to tell the general this yesterday, but I was just reviewing an article from the January, uh, a January edition of Vaenya Abazdrinya, Military Review in Russian. And this article stated quite emphatically, Russia is many times superior to the US in terms of tactical nuclear weapons. Think about that, folks. Uh, we have to be exceedingly careful in this crisis. Uh, I, I'll, I'll be glad to tell you more, although I think the general did a fabulous job yesterday in laying out that Russia has absolutely prioritized nuclear weaponry for the last 20 years. Its capabilities are, are modern and ready to be used. Uh, the second thing I say may be more controversial here, but I, I think it's just worth laying out that I think one of the questions that we were given originally concerned lessons from the Cold War. And one of those lessons is to be exceedingly careful and avoid nuclear crises and nuclear escalation. But another lesson, I think, from the Cold War um, concerns the spheres of influence as a way to uh, prevent you know, constant conflict and risk of escalation in war. Um, we can go into that more, but to me, uh, it's been a missing part of the discussion here, and we, we uh, you know, again, we have to keep our emotions in check and think about what is best for the United States. Thank you. So briefly, uh, a few questions that I think we need to grapple with uh, moving forward. Um, the first is uh, really addressing a question that we have dodged back and forth ever since 1991, uh, which is, is our problem with Moscow a question of personnel? Is it a question of regime type? Or is it a question of Russia as a geopolitical entity? Because how you answer that question has very profound implications for the policies you're going to adopt moving forward. If we think that this is largely a problem created by Putin personally, then if Putin is removed, does that create an opportunity for uh, resetting the relationship? If you're talking about changing a regime, which is talking about really replacing a political and business elite, then you are going to run into the same questions that the United States did not adequately answer in the months after the fall of Saddam Hussein in Iraq, which is how deep, how far do you go, what level of resistance does this engender, uh, and if you're talking about that this is a question of Russia within its essentially how it is composed as a state, as a multinational, uh, imperial, internally colonized, however, whatever terms you want to use, then the question is, is that no government in the Kremlin is likely to produce the outcomes that you want. And therefore, you are looking at the question of, of the Russian state. Uh, related to that is uh, the question of finally ending the strategic ambiguity about where Europe ends and the rest of the world begins. Uh, is Russia part of Europe? Is Russia not part of Europe? Uh, is Ukraine, Georgia, Armenia, Azerbaijan, are they Europe? Are they not Europe? Are they sort of Europe? Um, and really beginning to make those decisions. And something that Tom said from the uh, first panel, which I think is absolutely important for policy, is, as we've seen, a lot of talk of support in what Lyle refers to as kind of the moral outrage uh, of what we've seen over the last four weeks. Is that going to be sustained into long-term commitments, particularly financial and economic commitments of both the European Union and the United States to make substantive investments, whether it's uh, in containing Russia, rebuilding Ukraine, integrating uh, Eastern Europe into, into the core of the Euro-Atlantic world. And then finally, the third issue that we have to consider is that uh, the United States for the last 40 years has not wanted to see Russia and China essentially consummate their entente. Uh, have we essentially decided now that we're going to write that off and we don't really have a problem with China being the beneficiary 
uh, of the Ukraine war in terms of finally securing access to Russia's vast natural resource base and what is still a considerable military technical base as well. Uh, that essentially we are prepared to, we think that this newfound transatlantic and trans-Pacific unity now outweighs any possibility of a, U, of a Russia-China link-up, or at least of a China being able to absorb uh, that Russian base, because again, that has profound implications for, for U.S. policy. Lyle's already raised the nuclear issue, so I'm not going to uh, put that, but I think that's also what we would have to look at. I won't move. Uh, uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, I feel like uh, I've learned so much just myself from interacting with all of you. I just uh, really appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, as we've talked about kind of NATO expansion over the past day or so and kind of uh, sort of how Putin may or may not be feeling about the threat of NATO expansion, uh, it seems that we've kind of described NATO largely as a military alliance, and we've described it largely from a realist uh, international relations viewpoint. Uh, but I'm going to tell you a little story. Uh, in the 1990s, uh, the mid-1990s, so after Angela and I were in Russia, uh, my family moved to Bulgaria, and I was the press attache, and my husband opened the first security assistance office in Sofia, Bulgaria. And so his job was to bring the Bulgarians into the NATO alliance. Uh, and so we'd have all these experts from Washington and Brussels come over, and we'd usually have them over for dinner. And at some point, I said to my husband, how come every second dinner guest is a lawyer? It didn't compute for me. I assumed that mostly he would be thinking about, you know, sort of the interoperability of weapons, whether or not these folks understood the doctrine, uh, whether or not they were getting sufficient English and French training. Uh, but as we sort of uh, kind of had these people over and I began to learn, what I realized was in order to bring a nation that's basically coming out of an autocratic past into NATO, the most important things really are issues like civilian control of the military. Uh, they brought a lot of people over who basically talked about soldiers' rights. Uh, this is how you set up uh, something like a court-martial. Uh, these are the rights that your soldiers have. And so kind of what it showed me was that it's a military lens, but it's so much more than that. It's about rule of law. It's about these big questions, and I wrote them down. How is the military structured? What is the military for, right? You know, if you're the leader of this country, can you use the military to fight your own battles just because you feel like it? Uh, how does the military fit into the rest of society? Uh, what is uh, transparency? Who's owed information about the military? What do I have to tell other people about the military? And so if you think about this, if you change the role of the military in your society, you fundamentally change your society. Uh, and so that's kind of, I guess, the kind of the constructivist ideas perspective. Uh, and so I think as we think about sort of how Putin and why Putin was threatened by the rise of NATO, don't think about it purely from a realist kind of weapons-based way of sort of what you think an alliance is, because NATO in particular is so much more than that. Uh, and then sort of, uh, I'll talk fast. I know I've probably gone over my time. I'm going to put my intel hat on it for a minute. And if you're taking notes, write this down. In retrospect, lots of things seemed inevitable. And that's like a really good kind of intel analyst rule. And so that's a question that I found myself thinking about as I think about this conflict is, to some degree, there's sort of this sense of kind of inexorability, isn't it? Uh, and you think, well, you know, sort of as we write the story of World War II, we say, of course, Mol Molotov-Ribbentrop wasn't going to work. Of course, appeasement wasn't going to work because it seems so obvious later on kind of down the road historically. And so if you want to challenge yourself, maybe kind of picture yourself writing the story of this conflict 10 years from now and think to yourself, what in retrospect is going to seem inevitable, right? You know, is it inevitable that Ukraine is going to join NATO? You know, maybe we're going to postpone it. Maybe we're going to put it off for a few years. Is it inevitable that NATO is going to split apart? Uh, is it inevitable that uh, whoever replaces Putin is going to be significantly worse? Uh, so uh, I'm not going to give you any answers. I'm just going to give you some interesting questions that you might want to play with. What is it? Where are we supposed to speak? 
what, what was the question? Oh. Okay. Uh, yes. Thank you. Um, I'm since you are young people here, your students. Um, so a couple of things you have to remember: you get older and get real jobs and go work in your respective fields of um, professional occupation. In in foreign policy, in in diplomacy, when someone is talking to you, y you have to somehow force yourself to. Um, to imagine in their place. Like, you, you have to see the world from their perspective. It's not an easy thing to do. It's very difficult, in fact. And, and a, lo a lot of problems we have now in Ukraine and elsewhere around the world because decision makers, di diplomats, politicians fail to do that. Um, they, they just assume that the world operates like they see the world. It doesn't. Um, so and 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 the and the values and the and the arrangements we have political arrangements here in the United States or or, or Western Europe works similarly around the world. It doesn't. Um, it's just a if you say if, if you if you study engineer engineering and someone an engineer comes to you and tells you, I have this very thin cable and it can hold five tons of weight. So what do you do? You ask them, OK, can, can you demonstrate? Can we see whether the, that actually works that way? Um, and, and you go out and try to, to prove it or disprove it. If it doesn't work, well, maybe there are ways to improve it. And, and that's how modern uh, science, modern society operates. The benefits you enjoy from this society is based on interaction like that, uh, whether it's biology, chemistry, uh, uh, any field. But in, unfortunately, in, in foreign policy, in diplomacy, we use the old language. We use the language of tribalism and warfare. When someone comes to you, tells you, I'm really afraid what you're doing out there. Don't do it. The response is, oh, you are imagining it. We are not doing anything significant. You just misunderstand us. And it goes on and on, this conversation for years uh, between Russia and the West since the mid-1990s. So that, that, that's, that's, war, uh, that's a language of warfare, uh, of fight, of conflict. And you imagine you do this, you, you tell this to your girlfriend or your boyfriend over the over. over, over. You know, someone shares his or her concerns with you, and you tell them, you dismiss them. Your relationship is not going to last. You're going to fight every day, and it's gonna, your relationship is going to dissolve. It's the same same thing, you know, in uh, relations among among countries. So someone tells you they're really afraid of something, or even if you think they're imagining that 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 threat, you have to entertain the idea. Maybe something there. Maybe we can we can do something to alleviate your fear. Um, so, and in, in imagining also in in case of Russia, speaking about speaking about um, uh, values and our own perception. Uh, of the world being true everywhere. Um, civilian leadership over military, uh, Mary just mentioned. Excellent idea here. Very bad idea in Russia. Because normally, Minister of Defense, who is a top military um, professional in, in, in Russia and the former Soviet Union, historically stood between the top decision maker, civilian decision maker, and the nuclear button. Because the military in Russia People in the uniform respect the top general, the top guy. They don't respect civilian leader. They, they, they don't know who he is. He's the hunting body or the fishing body of Mr. Putin. And he's incompetent. Current, I'm talking about current uh, Minister of Defense. The previous one was an accountant. So he's, he's someone who can prevent nuclear war a guy who has no influence over uh, his, his, his boss's decisions is a bad idea in Russia. And there are a number of other things that the, the, the Russians and other countries have done according to Western standards that have misfired and worked actually to, to make situation worse. So remember these couple of things. You know, it's, it's very difficult to keep two contradictory ideas in your head and remain sane. But that's, that's what it takes to be a successful decision maker in foreign policy and successful diplomat. Thank you. 
Thank you very much for your opening remarks. I'm, I'm cognizant that this is both a panel on U.S.-Russian relations that includes, of course, the current conflict in Ukraine, but also other issues. And so I want to ask questions sort of in both areas. Uh, to begin with, uh, Dr. Gvozdev talked about the importance of framing the conflict. And there are several ways of interpreting the, the current conflict, the current war with Ukraine. Uh, depending on how you define it, also changes the options that um, on how best to respond. So a couple, couple possibilities. Is this an ideological conflict between the forces of democracy and autocracy? Is this a conflict about Russian security versus self-determination of its neighbors? Is this a conflict about Russia reestablishing itself as a global power after three decades of decline? Is it a conflict about Vladimir Putin himself needing to distract from his own low approval ratings and fear of political instability? Or is this conflict about something else? How, the question for the panel is that how would you frame this war and therefore what general strategy might the United States employ in response? Uh, okay, so <laughs> well, that's, that's a very complicated question. Um, is, you know, when war happens, and unfortunately in a large scale war like this, there are many reasons. There is no one single. You cannot boil down it to one thing. You know, people generally look for simple explanations, whether it's, um, it's, a, it's the origins of the universe or, or, you know, the complicated questions like this. Um, so war, this particular war entails a lot of things. It, it encompasses you know, power struggle, uh, the competition for um, uh, you know, resources. Um, you know, one thing we have to keep in mind that the Russian Federation reached its uh, oil um, production peak uh, sometime 2019, 2020. Um, it's uh, expanding influence, it's self-determination, it's historical factors in relation with Ukraine. Um, it's current Russian leadership's vision how the world should be, uh, should, should, uh, the world order, about new world order. They actually want to topple the existing uh, Pax Americana, American-dominated world order and created something new, create something new. That's why they, they enjoy support by um, People's Republic of China, India, Brazil, and others who are also unhappy with this. So there are many, many aspects to this. Uh, and uh, they're not going to uh, work out as those who are fighting this war envision. You know, the Russian may want something and get something else. That may, that may be worse. but. Um, a nuclear aspect of this confrontation makes things very difficult and unpredictable um, because otherwise the Russian Federation may have signed a peace agreement with Ukraine very similar to what Finland did with the Soviet Union in 1939 when Finland made concessions, didn't win the war, didn't lose the war, made some concessions to the Soviet Union and the, and the parties the two sides parted more or less uh, amicably. Uh, Russia's possession of nuclear weapons and its, um, its belief that it is the strongest military power in the world because it has so many tactical, more than 2,500 tactical nuclear warheads, which, by the way, are not a treaty weapons. They're outside the treaty because they are not uh, strategic weapons, um, uh, makes this uh, outcome of this conflict un un unpredictable. Um, I'd argue that this war is largely about norms. Uh, I, I think of Russia as a country that's kind of gradually been moving towards behaving like a rogue state in international relations. Uh, and in a sense, what we had in 2014 was we had a large-scale norms violation. And we've had those really kind of repeatedly from Russia whether it was the bombing of Grozny all the way back in the 1990s. Uh, and so the question really is, do we have any shared international norms that everyone buys into? Are we an international community? 
uh, and sort of this question of norms enforcement, right? Uh, and I guess norms is an issue that's really close to my heart because I study cyber, and we have these conversations all the time in cyber. What does it mean that we have no norms? Uh, and one of the things I always talk to my students about is I say, you know, if you look at the growth of international humanitarian law, it began in the 1500s, right, with chivalry and all that good stuff. Uh, and so we have a body of international law that to some degree most of us subscribe to because we built it over 500 years. And then I always say, you know, and we don't have a body of you know, international humanitarian law having to do with cyber because the internet was invented in like 1994. Uh, and so you really can't get those norms in a period of 30 years uh, the way you can in a period of 500 years. Uh, but I think that you know, when we look back kind of historically on this conflict, that's one of the questions that we may ask is sort of, when did sort of the waning of norms and norms enforcement uh, kind of begin? Uh, and I kind of feel like militarily, I don't think the United States should wade into providing a no-fly zone. I don't think that NATO should wade into this. I also am extremely worried about escalation. I'm worried about cyber escalating to kinetic. I'm worried about kinetic escalating to nuclear. But there's something to be said for the West somehow taking a stronger uh, stance in terms of saying, yes, we do have norms. We don't bomb buildings that are clearly labeled as having children in them. Uh, there are things that we, we in a civilized society do not do. Uh, and there's that concern that if we do not uh, come together as a community to enforce these norms that supposedly we all buy into, uh, I do worry it leaves the door open to China and Taiwan. But I also, I, it's, it's really tragic if you think about the fact that we've had international humanitarian law for over 500 years, uh, and yet we seem to still have these kind of major aspects of people not respecting it. Uh, and it makes you wonder about the future of international humanitarian law. So that's my upbeat answer. You know, the short answer to your question is it's, it's all of the things that you listed, which makes it difficult to come up with uh, a coherent set of policy responses because if you decide to say, look, we can make some sort of geopolitical adjustment, um, but if that's not, you know, but then it doesn't address necessarily the ideological uh, roots of the, uh, of the conflict, of the invasion, the, the question of norms, uh, so on and so forth, and also the fact that, um, you know, we are grappling with this we're in this period, this new cycle of adjustment where uh, the system that has emerged after the end of the Cold War, uh, and in fact the world that emerged after the end of the Cold War is changing. Uh, technologically changing, it's changing in terms of environment and climate, it's changing in terms of population and demographics, and you know, I think you have a, a concern from the U.S. side is we, we and our allies wrote a lot of the source code of the post-Cold War world, and we're worried about losing the ability to write the source code of the you know, era that we're entering into. And part of it is the question of norms, part of it, you know, up till February 24th, the sense that Russia and China uh, would be able to write more of that code or push back against us, uh, I think, has been, been a part of it. Um, in policy responses, I mean, one of the things that I'm finding very uh, surprising is the extent to which a number of commentators are very cavalier about the nuclear question. Um, that there really is a generational divide. If you remembered, either you were an adult during the Cold War or you were someone who was dragged to watch the day after when it was on TV in 1983, I think seared a certain uh, worry about nuclear escalation that, uh, frankly, younger generations seem to be more willing to roll the dice on. Uh, either, well, it won't have, I've seen things, well, he won't use them, Russia won't use them, uh, there are the generals will stop him, which as Lasha points out is, is, has been eroded, or that they won't work. I've seen that argument too. Uh, but that really raises these, these questions. And, it, and I want to bring it back to a point about U.S. domestic policy, which is the bargain we've had since the end of the Cold War domestically in the U.S. is that Washington gets a relatively free hand to intervene as long as the costs do not reach a certain level for the domestic population, which is we don't see our taxes increase, there's no draft, 
uh, we don't see, and, and Tom pointed again at this point, the, the gas price as a metric, you know, that I don't have to pay too much at the pump. And so now we, we are, I think, grappling with not only should we be doing from a systemic norm level in responding, but I think politicians here are also beginning, and in Europe as well, are beginning to, to navigate the question of how much can you ask of your societies and how long will that consensus last? And that has implications. Um, you know, do we go in and try to, you know, essentially say, I mean, I've heard people revive the old patent line, right? Well, let's just settle it now, right? Let's not, you know, let's go in and, and just, you know, fight it out with Russia and settle this once and for all. Of course, you know, with the nuclear question being uh, diminished, or do we, uh, you know, do you fight to the last Ukrainian? which is, Ukraine, you're doing a great service for the West, and we'll be happy to provide you with as many tools as you need to do the fight, but we're not going to get involved. Do we encourage a settlement? Do we, does the United States, Europe, China, all come together and do what the United States did at Dayton to end the Yugoslav Wars, which is you come in and you, you impose a settlement from the outside that none of the parties are particularly happy with, but which you know, ends the fighting? Um, and right now, I don't, you know, just looking at our own domestic politics, I don't see, um, you know, I see a lot of concern about um, how this plays out in the November elections and other things. I don't know that, that, that the U.S. has, you know, a complete free hand domestically to be able to address this. And then again, the longer term question of uh, what is the U.S.-Russia relationship going to look like? Are we, for, are we foreclosing? Uh, the dream, and you know, Mary, you talked about it, and uh, and others about you know we we wanted a better relationship with a different type of Russia in the 90s. Are we just you know going to write that off and and move forward and consolidate the Euro-Atlantic world? And uh, you know, how does this play out with China, with India? I mean, the point is is that this is not this issue is just so interconnected with so many other fundamental questions about what the U.S. role is going to be in the world. And if we don't have a domestic consensus, as we did during the Cold War, about what we're prepared to do, what costs we're willing to, to, to pay, we're just going to be tinkering at the margins, or we're going we're to ricochet from administration to administration and party to party, and that's not a good, good uh, position for having an enduring grand strategy. Uh, yeah, I, I would echo what, what has been said. that. You know, this is an immensely complex conflict. But I, I think probably, I mean, we have to, I think, uh, understand this as Putin's war. Uh, he didn't, you know, dream this up in two weeks, uh, as it has been said. He's really been pre preparing for this for, for years, if not decades. Um, you know, so how do we understand his motives? I think that is kind of the, the heart of the question. And, and here, I would say that, you know, on the one hand, you have, um, you know what it what amounts to a kind of very very dangerous noxious uh, nationalist ideology. You know, by the way, Russia is not the only country with such you know narratives um, that that develop into policy. You know, the fact that it, a certain type of regime. So these uh, he doesn't uh, meet. You know, he doesn't interact with many liberals, um, and this probably has a lot of uh, historical kind of overtones. You know, we, we understand he, he is interested in history, let's say more than a little, and has a kind of romantic viewpoint of uh, Slav Slavic brethren coming together. And he, I, I think in the back of his mind, he thinks Russia is a powerful country, but could be so much more powerful with Ukraine uh, hitched to the Russian wagon uh, that, that it, it, uh, all those resources and, and brilliant people in Ukraine can serve a greater goal. Uh, which is his dream. Um, of course, that's, that's very unlikely to happen, especially now. But, but I, look, on the other side of this, and, and I think we have to say it, uh, and here I, I think I disagree with some of my colleagues at the conference, but uh, to me, NATO is part of these motives, uh, a, a kind of fear of NATO, a loathing of NATO. Uh, I have very little doubt about that. Uh, you know, and I think there's plenty of evidence, you know, just go through Putin's speeches, you know, going back more than a decade. Uh, but but it's, it's deeper than that. Um, you know, I, I've monitored uh, NATO activities in Ukraine for over the decade, and I could tell you some details there. But it, it, to me, uh, it was uh, really excessive and maybe the worst of all worlds that it was, it didn't have a very strong warfighting component, but it, it kind of hinted at such 
components. And, and I, I'll just give you an example. For, I mean, by the way, there were almost continuous set of exercises. So one group of Americans would, would go in and then uh, come out, and then another would go in. So it, it was, you know, in other words, you could claim there was no NATO base there, but it was a continuous set of NATO exercises in Ukraine. Uh, but it was deeper than that. It was actual military infrastructure. And one example I'm very familiar with is uh, the port of Odessa, which has been in the news. Uh, your taxpayer money was funding a, a very fundamental upgrade of those piers. Why? What does that matter? Well, you upgrade the piers to uh, standards to take NATO warships. You know, and the Russians could see this trend of like more and more NATO warships coming into uh, the Black Sea, and indeed using Odessa as a major spot. And I believe in his speech right before the war, he he mentioned the uh, kind of a NATO op center that was, I don't know if it's officially NATO, but a, an operations center for maritime operations right near Odessa. So I'm just saying, to my estimate, uh, and if you we could go deeper and talk about Putin's assessment of Odessa generally, but, but I mean, in my view, this is waving a red flag in front of a bull. Uh, and was very poorly thought out. So, I mean, you know, we have to be, look, you know, P Putin deserves full responsibility for this war, but as Americans, I think we better be honest with ourselves and uh, realize that this was a, um, we, we made some major mistakes here. Uh, and, and by the way, I would just say, I've heard some things at this conference that, you know, I find a little bit disturbing, this kind of, you know, actually Putin may be Hitler, turns out. Uh, I don't accept that. I think that's a, a really a, quite a vast exaggeration of the threat. And uh, we, as Americans, we need to be realistic, uh, not emotional, and have a very uh, you know uh, objective assessment of the facts. Thank you. Thank you. In in my foreign policy classes, we talk about two equations that that don't um, have an equal sign. Power doesn't always equal influence. And secondly, that a, what a nation sees at stake does not necessarily mean that a proportional response is the best if the resulting cost might be too high. So if you were playing Joe Biden's national security advisor, you're getting a lot of, uh, a lot of advice, uh, particularly from folks who may not be in decision-making authority and though who can be therefore kind of loose in terms of what they would suggest that you do. But if you were Joe Biden's uh, national security advisor, uh, there's been talk of creating, as, as some of you mentioned, a no-fly zone, of escalating the types and amounts of weapons that could be sent, including MiG fighter jets, and enhanced economic sanctions, yet you also fear crossing some kind of bright line that Putin has in his head uh, that might escalate Russia's tactics and munitions choices or even lead to a direct attack on NATO territory. So what should President Biden do to straddle this line between giving enough aid to Ukraine but not too much? Okay, yeah, great question. And uh, frankly, I'm a little surprised we haven't discussed no fly zone at all. It seems to me that that really is the kind of the, the elephant in the room here. Um, but before that, I, I just want to mention quickly I mean, we need to, um, you know, there, there is some uh, good news here. Uh, there's been a lot of bad news, but there's a little bit of good news here, right? The, the Europeans are stepping up. This is fundamentally uh, a good news for the United States. I mean, I would say for, for decades, really, the United States, in a way, has been honestly taken to the cleaners uh, by European allies who, where we you know, spent all the money and did a lot of the fighting, and they uh, you know, spent tiddlywinks on defense, uh, to put it uh, candidly. Uh, that's been very disappointing and uh, had all kinds of deleterious uh, results that I can talk about. But, um, you know, I'm very pleased that Europeans are seeing this as a, you know, it is first and foremost a European problem. Uh, if they think that Putin is about to march on Berlin, I don't think he is, but if they are concerned about that, then they should, you know, and, and in, you know, I think any rational country right now would, wouldn't take a chance and, and would build up. And here, you know, what Germany is doing is, is uh, probably prudent, but I would like to see much more. I would like to see, uh, you know, greater integration and uh, countries all, oh, you, know, you know, why should they just spend 2%? Maybe they should come up to 2.5% or something like that. By the way, I didn't mention before, uh, NATO aggregate spending versus Russia, defense spending, 20 times what Russia spent, 20 times. So, you know, this, this, uh, there's room uh, for, for the Europeans, I think, to, to do much more. 
although they probably that it probably shouldn't be excessive either. Okay, let me come to the no-fly zone. Sorry, very quickly. I think it's a horrible idea. I think uh, we had better uh, think very carefully about ways in which uh, U.S. and Russia or U.S. and NATO would come into combat, and there are many other ways besides the no-fly zone. But to me, this is uh, hugely risky, and uh, I consider it a, you know, I'll just end by saying, uh, we, you know, those of us who follow nuclear strategy like I do, we, we would like to keep the chance of nuclear war well below 1% or maybe even below 0.1%, right? Folks, we are nowhere near there right now. We are like, I, I you know, I, maybe the general would put a better number on it, but you know, I'm afraid we're crossing 10%. Okay, that's, we do not want to be here. And unfortunately, the, the major scenario that I see, and by the way, I can give you a citation to, actually Nick and I were both there at Naval War College. We did a study on this, it's actually published online, but it says pretty clearly that Russia, unlikely to resort to nuclear weapons unless the regime is threatened by something that happens on the battlefield. We may about be about to see that. And as has been discussed, Russia has plenty of tactical nuclear weapons to use. We could talk about what the targets would, could, would be. We could talk about what the U.S. response would be. But I, I am very concerned about this. And a no-fly zone is, is one clear pathway to get there. So we had better avoid that. Thank you. Building on what Lyle said, I think, and we've already seen the administration, I think, do this, and of course has suffered a lot of, you know, it's easy to cart from the sidelines and to call for things that you know aren't going to happen because you want to score political points. Uh, and I think we've seen that with some of these calls for no-fly zones, because it's really easy to posture to say, well, I wanted to have a much stronger response. It's safe in the knowledge it's not going to happen. One of the things with that, too, again, a lot of the commentary is all over the map, because technically a no-fly zone is about keeping aircraft out of the air. Uh, what a lot of people have in mind when they're talking about a no-fly zone for Ukraine is what happened in Libya, which is you're using your aircraft to strike targets on the ground. You're looking to do a no-drive zone, a no-artillery zone, uh, which, and we should then just be you know, up front if what you're saying is that the United States or NATO uh, and NATO can only do this with the concurrence of its 30 members, uh, wants to become a co-belligerent, then that's, that's a realm, but just, just be open about it. And I think one of the things that the Biden administration has been doing is to, to really strip away ambiguity, uh, is to be very clear and not to play fast and loose with terms. Um, that, you know, if we want to be a co-belligerent, we can be a co-belligerent, but not to give, use some sort of antiseptic term uh, that the public thinks carries no risk for Americans or for Europeans. Um, I think making it very clear that yes, um, for these years we've paid, paid fast and loose with terms like ally, and it's been one of my pet peeves. Uh, regretfully, Ukraine is not an ally of the United States. Ally does not mean we like you, does not mean you're our friend. An ally legally means we have a binding arrangement, a treaty obligation, to do things for each other. Ukraine does not have any such agreement. The Budapest Memorandum is a memorandum. It's not even an executive agreement. And the Office of Legal Counsel weighed in on this in 2014, said this is not a binding, nothing in this memorandum is binding on the United States. Um, we do not have a bilateral defense treaty. We do not have, uh, NATO's, no, so Ukraine's not even been raised to the status of a major non-NATO ally, which the president can do at the stroke of a pen. He could, any president since 1994 could have designated Ukraine a major non-NATO ally. Um, and that has not happened. And I think what you now have and people are critical of is we have this, well, and I used to hear this in, at the Loisak group and others, well, but you know, there are virtual allies. Ukraine is a virtual ally, and they should be covered under a virtual Article 5. That, 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 that's not how it works. Um, and I think that the president has been very clear about, yes, there is NATO territory, that, and that we are prepared to escalate, to defend. If there is an incursion, we, are, you know, we will have the full range, but we're not going to um, kind of operate in this degree of uh, strategic ambiguity about, well, you're sort of NATO or, uh, or the like. Um, this also has obligations, but I think the president has been very clear on this and the people around him. Um, everyone knows Article 5. Uh, I have a nice point I like to raise on Twitter, which is, you know, first rule of NATO Fight Club, you actually have to know what's in the treaty. 
Um, everyone quotes Article 5 and think this means you go to war. That's not what Article 5 says. It just simply says you consult and take the measures you see fit to respond to an armed attack. And then you have little problems like Article 8, which means that if, say, Poland decides it wants to get involved in Ukraine, which is Poland's sovereign right to do so, uh, it can't rely on the alliance because Article 8 says you can't take steps that essentially create international obligations for the rest of the alliance if the rest of the alliance has not agreed to that. Now again, if all 30 members of the alliance meet in Brussels and say we will use, and you can use Article 4, we have a threat to peace and security in Europe, we all agree as the 30 that NATO will do this, but again, these are levels of diplomatic action and you have to hold, again, NATO is a like the old Polish sim is, you know, Librum Vito. One NATO country can say, we don't want to do this, and that's it. Um, what should we be doing forward? Um, I think Israeli Prime Minister Bennett got a very bad rap. I think um, people misinterpreted his advice to President Zelensky, uh, which was not to surrender, but essentially is get the fighting stop now. Get a ceasefire. Every day this goes on, the damage that is done to Ukraine is, is irreparable. Uh, the Ukrainian, U Ukraine was already the poorest country in Europe. It, it's, it, it actually, Moldova actually went ahead of Ukraine. So uh, Moldova is no longer the poorest country in Europe, it's Ukraine. Um, there's a lot of reconstruction that's gonna have to happen. Uh, get a ceasefire, put some things on the table, and also let things take their course. If this war, which I personally think has done a major piece of damage to Russian power. You know, get a ceasefire now, um, and then let kind of the process of what's happening in Russia play itself out uh, in a way that may be very different a year or two years from now. So, and again, I think you're seeing the administration quietly encouraging the process Turkey is doing, the administration officially, I mean, not people on Twitter, but the administration has not poo-pooed anything Israel has been trying to do to get the two together. Uh, we've even cautiously said, look, if China wants to play a role in mediating, you know, we would welcome that, and I think that that's good advice. Getting this, you know, getting, getting the fighting stopped, and this is, again, we're back to the Dayton model. Uh, a lot of people didn't like the Dayton Accords, but, you know, the one benefit of, great benefit of the Dayton Accords uh, is that zero people have died in Bosnia as a result of fighting since 1995. So if nothing else from the, just the basic right to life question, I think pushing for a cessation of hostilities, even if it doesn't give you the emotional satisfaction of marching into the Kremlin, frog marching Putin to The Hague, uh, and you know, raising the um, uh, blue and gold flag over, over the Kremlin, which I don't think, you know, but you're, you're, seeing people you're seeing people advocate that, right? We, this war cannot end until you have a battleship Missouri surrender. Um, very, I think we'd be very bad for Ukraine and um, over time runs the risk that this conflict gets out of hand. Um, yeah, if I were speaking with the president, the first thing I would urge him to do would be to clarify his objectives. Uh, I think if we know anything from history, it's that wandering into a conflict without being exactly sure of what it is that you want to accomplish is a very bad idea. Uh, and so the questions that I think we really need to be asking, sort of whether we're in leadership uh, or whether we're just kind of the population is, if the United States, uh, either unilaterally or with NATO, were to get more deeply involved in Ukraine, what would be the specific objectives how would we measure whether or not we had actually met those objectives and what would be the plan for leaving once we had? Uh, I think those are questions that, uh, they're, they're good questions to ask. Uh, and what concerns me is you kind of alluded to that, when you hear people talk about kind of what the US quote unquote should do, there seems to be kind of this very broad set of objectives uh, and uh, sort of, you know, would the point of the U.S. going into this conflict, you know, be the same as the U.S. marching all the way to Baghdad and getting rid of Saddam Hussein? I mean, is what we're talking about, you know, deposing Putin? Uh, are we talking about getting Russia as a revanchist power to change its policy preferences? 
Are we talking about getting Russia as a revanchist power to change its behavior? Or are we talking about something on a much smaller scale, like maybe tomorrow no one will die in Ukraine? Because uh, those are very, very different objectives. And so I think the first thing we really need to get a handle on is what exactly it would be that we would be attempting to accomplish if we were to wade further into this. And I don't think there is a consensus in American society. There's not a consensus, I think, in the Senate and Congress. Uh, I don't think there's a consensus in the media. And so uh, that would be the first thing, would really be to sort of clarify the problem before you attempt to solve it. Uh, in terms of risks, uh, one thing I just want to mention is we talk a lot about this risk of something escalating to nuclear, but uh, I have been really interested by this uh, sort of uh, suggestion that someone floated that the ICANN, the International Consortium for the Assignment of Network Names, basically the people who kind of built and control the internet, it's supposed to be international, but kind of like the UN, the US pays all the bills, it's located in the United States. Uh, I think it actually has an office in Brussels as well. Uh, but there's been this discussion about, uh, you know, let's cut .ru off from the root directory and basically disconnect them from the internet. Uh, and in terms of, and people kind of like it because it's, it's something you can do, uh, it, you can't sort of halfway achieve it, it's something you fully achieve, uh, and maybe you know there won't even be any bloodshed, it's just something that you do. But I think the other issue we really need to think about is the idea of having, uh, basically going back to a Soviet Union that's un inscrutable, right? That whole sort of, you know, Churchill or Riddle wrapped in an enigma. Uh, the idea that you know we're going to be back to sort of looking at pictures and trying to figure out who's sitting next to who at you know the October Revolution military parade, uh, I don't think that's something we want to do. And so the question is also going to be sort of how do we accomplish whatever objective maybe we finally agree upon in a way that we're not going to get Russia to, Russia to sort of, and that's why we shouldn't cut them off from the internet, by the way, is we don't want to have a Russia where we honestly have no idea what's taking place in there. Uh, the idea that it could, could be sort of completely uh, irrational and unpredictable. I think that's really a scary risk that we need to think about. Um, if I were advising President of the United States, I would suggest um, uh, that he resign. <laughs> I'm, I'm serious. I fully understand this, these kinds of suggestions wouldn't uh, go well in the White House, but I, I think the situation is serious enough to um, ask Mr. Biden to resign and hand over to Mrs. Harris. Um, um, Mrs. Harris is an enigma for the Russian decision makers. Um, they don't know her very well. Uh, Mr. Biden has been studied very well due to his long service and his connection with Ukraine, his son's connection with Ukraine. Besides, he also burned bridges with Mr. Putin. Um, and they, he has zero influence and respect in, in the Russian leadership. And also, uh, let's remember that um, the current Russian leadership comes from old Soviet misogynistic culture, which does not understand women. They are apprehensive of women. And if uh, Mrs. Harris, too, were put an act that she is aggressive, not towards Mr. Putin, but towards her staff, people around her, she is unpredictable. Um, she throws tantrum here and there. Um, Russians, Putin will get a message. Uh, no one wants someone to order, you know, 10 megaton bombs to drop over Moscow. And if, if you're facing someone who is who you cannot understand, uh, is aggressive, unpredictable, you may want to slow down. Okay, so, and the fact that when Mr. Putin announced war, uh, invasion, Ukraine, invasion of Ukraine, uh, and warn the United States <clears throat> to stay away or face the, the worst day of your, in your history and, and actually threatened us with nuclear, uh, nu uh, nuclear retaliation. That message was taped two days to, uh, uh, prior. And he ended that section of his message by telling us that I have already given orders to my forces, relevant orders. So that tells you that he's cautious. He's still 
The reason he taped it, because if you, if you tell me you're going to attack me with nuclear forces, you call for a first strike from my side. So the only thing I have left now is to attack you, because the first strike is more, more, most likely win this kind of war. But he was being cautious, he prepared, he taped it, he got his forces ready, then he told us. So that suggests he's being cautious still. And he does not want uh, unpredictable reaction by the United States. Uh, so that would be the best option for us right now. But as you will understand. You all in the audience have been very patient. Let me ask folks who have questions to come down to either of the two microphones for the time remaining. And if you could identify yourself before you ask the question, that would be great. Thank you. And we can start on this side of the room. Is it on? There we go. Yes. Hi. Um, good afternoon. My name is Cadet Rory Stewart. Um, and my, my question pertains more to kind of our young generation of students in the audience that are aspiring, aspiring diplomats. Um, so in, in reference to this sort of crisis, what strategy or what useful asset do we have to sort of handle these conflicts for the future? And what lessons can we learn to take this step forward to kind of create a career where we're setting ourselves up for success for potential crises in the future or even to take over when we kind of move into that professional world? I guess I'd urge you to learn Russian. Uh, <laughs> I think that, uh, again, one thing that we do see is that uh, I personally view this as an intelligence failure. I think that we uh, did sort of uh, have some wrong information about uh, Russian objectives, about Russian assets, and uh, I, I think it's just really important for people to still learn foreign languages. Uh, I know there's a tendency for everybody your age, I have three kids your age, to want to be very careerist and think about, you know, you know, what specifically is going to get me a job, uh, but it's still really, really useful to understand a culture. I think one thing that maybe you got out of this whole conference is history matters, right? We kind of pretended for a long time that it didn't, uh, but, you know, we've heard people make references over the last couple of days to, you know, 1939 and, you know, Ivan the Terrible, the idea that sort of we do need to understand uh, our adversaries, we need to understand their history, we need to speak their language, uh, and uh, just learn more about sort of the process of diplomacy itself. Uh, something that I find myself thinking about, you know, is if, God forbid, you know, 10 years from now, Russia looks like North Korea, uh, you know, what do diplomats do in that situation? Uh, you know, do we have exchanges and how do you talk to people who are very different than yourselves? Uh, you know, what do confidence building measures look like for neighbors that don't trust each other? Uh, and uh, I think uh, really uh, kind of Sometimes there's a tendency to, uh, if you, particularly if you want to be a diplomat, to be really, really interested in like American foreign policy. But it's also really, really important to uh, know those enemies and to know your neighbors as well. Um, yeah, I would just underline that as well. I mean, to focus on history, focus on languages, absolutely. I mean, can't can't say that enough. And and by the way, you know, new technology. You know, I speak a couple of languages. I but I was never talented at languages. But but uh, these new technologies. You know, I mean, if you want to sit all day and watch Russian TV or Chinese TV or whatever. Uh, here in in Vermont, you can do that. That didn't exist when when uh, we were studying. So you you have a lot of advantages and and take advantage and and your skills will help our country in these circumstances. But one other thing I would say is that, you know, diplomacy going forward and what how does our State Department work and so forth. For, first of all, it's vastly under resourced and and. Uh, U.S. diplomats are an incredible asset to our country, but I think I fear we have most of them stamping passports, which you know we should be using their skills in a much wiser way. Uh, and um, I would throw on there, you know, lately over the last decades, our diplomats seem to be, you know, we got to look on the website for what our policy is, just 
have a meeting, read our talking points, and that's pretty much what you want to do. I, to me, that's not diplomacy. Diplomacy is give and take. It involves not just sticks and threats. It involves carrots. I mean, look at this meeting with Biden and Xi. The headlines, at least, were all, you know, here are the 10 ways we're going to punish China if they dare to help Russia. <laughs> Maybe we should have turned it around, said, how can we improve U.S.-China relations and maybe that will have the effect that we actually want. So building in incentives to cooperate. Thank you. Thank you for your question. How are you doing? My name is uh, Cadet Lorenz Simpkins. And um, earlier, uh, I believe it was you, Dr. Goldstein, spoke about, um, I think you used the analogy, the uh, red, flag, red flag in front of the bull for um, some of the actions that precipitated um, Russian actions in Ukraine. Um, do you think that and then you later spoke about, obviously, um, our NATO partners having an increased level of activity and funding in NATO. Do you think that the increase in activity and funding of these NATO partners, would could that not serve to exacerbate that red flag in front of the bull issue? Or do you think that the United States taking maybe a step back in, in terms of influence and control over NATO would actually allow, kind of mitigate those impacts? Uh, yeah, that's that's a really interesting question. Uh, let me, I'll just give you another example of the red flag, by the way. Uh, the, these, um, there are ballistic missile defense radars that we put up in Poland and uh, Romania. And by the way, you know, every year the Russians would come back and say, you cannot do this. You, this is really destabilizing. And we know how much the Russians care about their nuclear deterrent, I mean, to some crazy degree. So no matter how we assured them that those radars are actually pointed at Iran, nothing to do with you. You know, do you think they really believe that? You know, so in retrospect, I think that was a huge mistake. Uh, another example of waving that red flag, and and sure, they thought next we we're going to build one of those in Ukraine. Although you don't really need to, because those the ones back there were so important. But but I mean, as far as the, I, I think, uh, look, NATO increased European expenditures. That's definitely good for the U.S. You know, I guess it allows us to focus on the Pacific, which has been our kind of. Strategy. By the way, the Indo-Pacific strategy published right, right. I think the day before the war began, so you can, it didn't get much attention. But, but uh, so, so that's good. But you raise an interesting point. You know, it, could that make it worse? Could, could Germany doubling its defense funding just, just exaggerate all those Russian fears? And I, I think, we, we have to be sensitive to that it's, you know, but I one, bit of confidence I have is. Americans, you know, we're, we're kind of, uh, let's say, we're, we're, we don't focus on, you know, generally don't focus on Ukraine, don't focus on Romania. You know, most Americans had, would have no idea where Moldova is, for example. Europeans do know these things. They know the details. They know the history. They follow these issues extremely closely. And they also know a lot of Russians, and they, they're aware of Russian sensitivities. So I ha you know, this is why part of US policy should be empower the Europeans to take their security in their own hands, manage. They should be managing the negotiations, not relying on the United States to do it. Actually, if you review the diplomacy of the last you know, four months, right before the war, could a deal have been made? I happen to think a deal could have been made. But part of it was this kind of tossing the football between Berlin and Paris and, and Rome and, and sending it back to the US. Oh, the Americans will handle it. This is a, a recipe for a disaster, which we have. Let the Europeans should lead on European security. Let me just uh, touch base, though, on, and this goes back to the question about diplomacy as well, about knowing your carrots, your sticks, what you're prepared to do, the level of creativity. Because, you know, Lyle, on the one you're talking, and the Russians, I think, had, had, some, had some genuine security concerns. I mean, Ukraine has genuine security concerns, too. And I think if we had linked the training that we were doing towards creating you know, moving Ukraine towards armed neutrality, right? a neutrality that doesn't depend upon the goodwill of your neighbors, but you can enforce it. And you know, we had a path in terms of what Azerbaijan has been doing. Azerbaijan has been officially neutral since 2012, uh, but you know, has a very robust military, has very robust capabilities that makes uh, challenging them uh, you know, raises a cost. Uh, we could have explored those options. Uh, we didn't. Um, you know, all of this talk about you know airspace. You know, we could have said that as part of a Ukrainian neutrality deal, um, NATO countries will operate air defense 
uh, facilities on the border with Poland and Hungary, which would give you coverage over most of Ukrainian airspace, but could not then touch the Russian security bubble. By the way, we did this with Cyprus. This was the Cyprus deal of 1997, when Cyprus was buying air defense equipment, and Turkey said this will allow Cyprus to target jets in Turkish airspace. So those systems were moved to Crete, so they can cover Cyprus, but can't touch Turkey. Um, this, though, goes back to diplomacy. It means that you have to be able to sell this. You have to be able to get people to sign on a dotted line when they say, well, I want full membership in NATO, right? So that was Ukraine's push after 2014, and Russia was never no membership in NATO. And, and also, finally, on your point there, I think which is very important, um, Lyle, you know, my understanding is, is that then that last week of talks between Schultz, Macron, and Putin, one of the hangups was uh, Putin saying to Schultz and Macron, and the Americans are on board with this, and Schultz and Macron saying, we can't guarantee that the Biden administration will uh, agree to any of this. And so Putin saying, fine, let the cannon decide, as the saying goes, um, because why am I talking to you when I should be just talking to, uh, to, to Joe Biden? One last thing on diplomacy, which is, again, goes back to domestic politics. U.S. still does not have a Senate-confirmed ambassador in Kiev. We've not had one since 2019. It's 2022. Um, so, you know, it's great that all these members of Congress have their uh, blue and yellow on, and yet for some reason we can't get a nomination through the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. So, you know, again, domestic politics and domestic consensus on this matters. So you have a U.S. diplomat in Kiev who is not technically the personal representative of the president uh, and does not enjoy the uh, confidence of the Senate to be able to be uh, in that position. And as far as I know, even with the war going on, there is no move to expedite getting an ambassador uh, in Kiev. So just leave it there. Good morning. Uh, I'm Cadet Corporal Thomas Harwood. I, my question is just generally for the panel. Um, what do you think the implications of recent events are on U.S. foreign policy in the sense of interventionism, like in foreign conflict? Take a stab, start with that. You know, this comes after the withdrawal from Afghanistan, right? And then there's been, you know, how does that fit in the idea of a 20-year mission to reshape a society that uh, essentially ended with the U.S. packing up and leaving um, and raising questions about the efficacy of American power to intervene and to reshape. And, and that a number of months later, you have, well, the, you know, the United States should be prepared to intervene uh, militarily uh, in a conflict with, with a nuclear armed power. So I think that um, it, it speaks to a real question about, and this goes back to questions about narrative, it goes back to questions about what are the goals and objectives, what are you trying to do. Um, I, I think we have a sense that um, intervention still really is something that doesn't cost the U.S. anything. Right. We can intervene, and, and again, the last 20 years, to be frank, the United States made major mistakes, had major setbacks that didn't really impact the domestic lives of Americans. Right? There's no sense that having more or less not succeeded as we wanted to in Iraq, having left Afghanistan, that there's any domestic. Um, the problem is, is that if we're moving into an era of state-on-state -state competition with actors who have just one thing about the Russia-Ukraine war is showing that Ukraine, which is a middle power, Ukraine is not Afghanistan. You have these people expressing these things about, well, the Russians are taking all these losses and America only took so many losses in Afghanistan. Um, the Taliban had no air force, had no air defense capabilities, had no tank productions, had no, uh, you know, this is, this is state on state war between a, a, what we would think of as a great power uh, and, but what is a middle power. And there are costs. And I think Americans have not internalized that even a short clash with a middle power is going to probably have costs that most Americans have not thought of. If anyone has read Stavridis and Ackerman's 2034, 
his novel of the next world war, which uh, starts off with Americans being shocked at losing a carrier in the South China Sea and what, what, what impact that has on Americans. Wait a minute, we lost a carrier? You know, not just a few people here and there in a roadside bomb attack. Um, I think we're not, we haven't gotten there yet. So you have people saying, well, we can do, right, we can do a no-fly zone because what's going to happen? We, how many planes did we lose in the Iraqi no-fly zones? Right? And so we're still thinking, okay, one reason why General Milley didn't want to do the no-fly zone over Syria is he said, I can guarantee we're going to start losing aircraft, Mr. President, and then two days later you're going to be under pressure once American pilots are being paraded on Syrian TV to, to get us out of there. I don't know that we have a social um, understanding uh, of the risks uh, of what it would take to do some of these interventions because at, we spread out the costs of Afghanistan. The individual cost on Americans was spread out over 20 years. Yeah. So, um, and I worry too, this is also what I call the call of duty effect, right? I mean, when you play a lot of call of duty, it's, you know, it just seems like, hey, let's just go in there and, you know, we'll just kick some, you know, and, and with no cost. But, you know, again, this is, as the Russians are finding out in Ukraine, this isn't a video game. And I don't know that we've reached a social level yet that says we're willing to lose five, 10,000 people in an intervention within a matter of weeks or months. It's always, oh my gosh, okay. Uh, it's always uh, interesting, I think, to think about kind of buzzwords that you hear uh, used by diplomats and then maybe a couple years later you say, whatever happened to whatever that term was that everybody was throwing about? Um, well, responsibility to protect. Remember R2P, that if this conflict had occurred 10 years ago or 20 years ago, it would have been all about R2P, right? There wouldn't even have been any other discussion. Uh, the idea that sort of, you know, a major power has a responsibility to intervene in a situation where genocide is taking uh, place. Uh, and the whole thing with R2P was kind of like, this is not negotiable, this is not debatable, this is the way we understand the issue. And so. Uh, something that it points to is kind of the expiration of that understanding that we are compelled, we're morally compelled, and that there's a consensus. Uh, talking about the risk as we talk about it now is certainly a very different conversation than that R2P conversation. Well, one, maybe just one quick comment. Um, there, and, and here I'm borrowing an idea I heard uh, Nick Vosdev say uh, um, a week ago when he spoke at Brown. but. It, um, you know, one thing the Ukrainians are illustrating is how, you know, uh, highly motivated people with even some pretty simple weapons are are able to defend their homes, and it's incredible, uh, actually, to to behold, really. Uh, but I mean, that in a way that gives some hope that, um, you know, that uh, perhaps we are entering an era where even a great power uh, seemingly able to just uh, trounce its its neighbor, but maybe not. In other words, a small small medium countries uh, have have uh, hope of reasonable defense and and that can allow the US to uh, to um, you know not be uh, try to you know let's face it after uh, reviewing the last 30 years we have as, as my colleague said uh, made a lot of mistakes uh, certainly intervened too much put a little uh, uh, too much uh, faith in in the use of force um, so so uh, I think we, we need to go to another model where force is truly a last resort. Uh, and uh, you know we 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 make sure that stick is very big and strong, but we we hardly ever use it, and only use it when it's absolutely necessary. That's that's I think the preferred approach. And this, you know, I think letting uh, letting people defend themselves, maybe giving them the tools here and there, but but uh, the you know we can see that uh, uh, sometimes that works better and and Russia is is severely uh, chastised and and uh, may may indeed lose uh, a lot so so the Ukrainians are teaching the Russians a lesson if you will thank you we have time for one more question hello everyone Sergeant Corey or uh, thank you all for coming here and fielding our questions uh, so we hear a lot of talk about you know no fly zones and hammer them with more um, sanctions, things of that nature, but try and do think outside of the box when you're looking at diplomacy. Um, often just trying to prove one's right and one's wrong is not always effective, but if you're able to provide someone with a back door, so to speak, a way to step down and still feel as though they have won the argument, right? 
um, is there a way in which we could set that stage? And by we, I mean whomever in the world is able to do that. And B, is there an entity or person who would be able to reasonably help to broker that deal? I'm thinking that's a Lyle question. It's all about the Asian idea of saving face, isn't it? Uh, yeah, well, thank you, Mary. You set me up well. Uh, <laughs> I, I mean, I, I've always been a, a fan of this kind of diplomacy of off ramps. Um, I think it's critically important. I mean, in the nuclear era, um, you know, our presidents, uh, you know, Kennedy told us not to be afraid to negotiate. And indeed, you know, people, not everybody knows it, but the Cuban Missile Crisis, which I urge all students of national security to review in great detail. By the way, note that probably the most dangerous elements of that crisis were whether tactical nuclear weapons would be employed. I've, I interviewed a Soviet, former Soviet submarine captain who had literally his trigger finger on a tactical nuclear torpedo that would have, you know, taken out our amphibious group, and we didn't even know about it. Uh, just saying, these, these elements are so important. So how, what is that off-ramp, which in the Cuban Missile Crisis was the, um, was the trade of the Turkish, uh, the missiles in Turkey? So, the, you know, you have to kind of give face. And, and uh, the second, you know, who, who can mediate? I think that was part of the question, too, is, uh, you know, I think that's just such an important question. And um, Nick Vazdev brought up the, uh, the example of the Israelis. I think that the you know, that should be fully supported. Uh, there are other countries, too. I think China, um, you know, imagine China and Israel working on this together. I mean, if you will, two opposites, but two countries that know a, a thing or two about military affairs. Uh, China has a very a wide experience with UN peacekeeping. People don't realize, but peacekeepers, I think, are part of the solution. And I love uh, Nick Vazdev's idea of using the Dayton model. That's, to me, uh, this, I think some good student papers can come out of this even in this spring. <laughs> I just want to introduce a note of pessimism, though. I've been talking with some colleagues in DC, and one trend that they find worrying is what they're calling the Saddam Husseinization of Putin, that there was a point at which Saddam Hussein, after 1991, was just beyond the pale. You couldn't negotiate with him. You could try to box him in and contain him, but you know he was be considered beyond the pale. And the question is whether or not Putin has reached that level. Um, that you know, no longer we're not going to we the Ukrainian. Well, President Zelensky says he still wants to meet face to face with him. But you know, in the U.S. political context, have you gone? Is, or have we crossed the Rubicon where, having sort of set up a certain thing, you can't then say, well, now we can have an agreement and we can back away? And no, it will require. We have to deal with someone else. Um, and again, this is why my advice, the longer this goes on, the harder it is to walk back from statements and positions that you know, you've taken. Um, and you know, this is on all sides, by the way. This isn't just that we're waiting for, you know, is Putin off, you know, Putin has offered no off ramps of his own, right? He had the ability to offer off ramps, which he has chosen not to do because he's considered, continue to insist on a maximalist agenda. So um, you know that that's an issue, but the, the Saddam. If if Putin moves into full Saddam, and this is why the Hitler leaving aside the Hitler comparison, I think the Saddam Hussein one is actually more relevant from a policy perspective because then there is a point at which you say we cannot end this. We can try to contain. Containment breaks down, um, and you're just left with all of this in limbo. And you know what that means for the world economy. Um, if you if you freeze today, the, 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 you just throw these couple points out. You freeze the the lines they are today with no settlement, uh, and you look at what the impact. I mean, there's going to be people going hungry around the world this summer because Ukrainian food exports won't be occurring. Um, and then longer term, you want climate change things. I mean, Russia was supposed to play a role with nuclear and hydrogen. Now all that's off, and everyone's back to discovering that they're going to burn coal again, and so yeah, there's again that if this is if we Saddam Husseinize this approach, it's not just the geopolitics, but you're talking about impacts on climate, environment, demography, economics. Yeah. yeah. So a couple a couple a couple takeaways. Uh, this event could be the 9/11 of your generation in terms of foreign policy. 
and it could replace the Cuban Missile Crisis for scholars of a foreign policy 30, 40 years from now in studying how to escalate and de-escalate tensions. Diplomacy is an art and a science, and compromise is not a dirty word. Always think about relations between nations from other nations' perspectives and their interests as well as your own. Domestic politics and public opinion in a democracy can be both a help and a hindrance in solving foreign policy crises. Conflicts can be easily started, but ending them is arduous, slow, and messy. And finally, hindsight, all things are clear and clean. 30 years from now, this will be a couple paragraphs in a textbook on US foreign policy. With that, I'd like to uh, thank our panelists, if we could give them a round of applause. And now a couple words from Dr. Ku. <laughs> Dr. Rolly Brooken, thank you so much for your just uh, uh, nice uh, management of this great panel discussions. So yesterday, today, uh, we had uh, just a lot of uh, talks and discussions and debates and questions and answers. So I think if I remember correctly, 2017, uh, Dr. Travis Morris and I just uh, we uh, had a vision to have Peace and War Summit. So at the time, we decided the topic, uh, just the first topic was North Korean uh, nuclear and missile challenges. And then just at the time, we think, thought about uh, Chinese, US-China uh, just rivalry, and then Russian topic we chose. So five years ago, all these topics were in our uh, thoughts. But thankfully, uh, not thankfully, actually, unfortunately, uh, just the uh, uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine happened, and then uh, suddenly it became a uh, big topic and uh, controversial topic. So over the last two days, uh, we were able to promote our understanding of this very important issue and just the global uh, challenges we are currently facing. So hopefully, uh, all of us uh, just uh, can broaden our perspective, especially future leaders. Uh, you can embrace not only the United States, but also the whole world in which there are so many difficult challenges and problems and issues, uh, just uh, ranging from the Africa and Latin America, Europe, uh, Asia, India, China, and everywhere. So uh, hopefully all of you can play a significant role in preventing this kind of conflict from taking place. If that happens, uh, you can play amazing role in handling, making reconciliation, and just uh, resolving the historical uh, dispute and all those kinds of conflicts uh, in the amazing ways. Thank you so much. And next year, 2023, March 20th and 21, uh, we're going to have fourth Peace and War Summit, uh, which addresses the topic of Iran and the Middle Eastern issues. See you next March. Have a nice day. Thank you so much for your participation and active uh, just uh, attendance in this summit. <laughs>